engage in a conversation about today. I think most of us would agree that the phrase values voters really took hold of the American lexicon in 2004 and following the 2004 election cycle. Cable news commentators, political strategists, political candidates, the American public, everyone all of a sudden started talking about the values voter. And I think for those of us who practice our religion in some form, quite often we were surprised and, and actually pleased to be discovered. Um, so after that took place, we also realized in the course of the conversation that um, the term values voter had taken on a particular meaning. Um, and in conversation, people were describing it as the fundamental difference between those who supported conservatives and those who uh, supported progressives. More narrowly, and over the past few years, the term values voters has been used to refer to those who vote with the religious right. And alarmingly, values voters have been cast as the rising tide against progressives who had lost contact with the moral pulse of the country. However, since then, the dialogue on American values has expanded and it is becoming clear that America's moral compass does not point exclusively to the right. In fact, those we at the Center for American Progress had started describing as the new silent majority appear to be finding their voice. Composed largely of religious moderates and progressives, their values include the alleviation of poverty, treatment of pandemic diseases like AIDS, and a commitment to the common good. Through much of the work and effort that's taken place since 2004, the silent majority is now finding its voice. Here at the center, we've done a lot of work on the issue of faith, and shortly after the 2004 election, we sponsored a few questions in a poll that was put forth by Zogby International. And in that poll, which came out really just a few days after the election, we found that far from dividing the electorate between conservative believers and progressive secularists, that values voters were remarkably unmoved by the pronouncements of the religious right. Greed, materialism, and poverty were the most important moral issues for voters. Additionally, just this past June, a study by the Center's Faith and Progressive Policy Initiative confirmed the findings in that 2004 poll and further debunked the theory that the right owns Americans values voters. Our June study found that far from the conventional story of moral decline in America, a political narrative about how gay marriage and abortion are eroding traditional family values, voters are far more concerned with our government's inability to protect the common good and address collective concerns such as poverty, health care, homelessness, the environment, living wage, etc. These are the values that they deem most important and care the most about. So as we're coming out of another election cycle, we are still talking about values voters, but the, excuse me, but the dialogue on values has decidedly changed since 2004. In the past, the voices of religious moderates and progressives have been largely drowned out by the religious right. A critical finding of the 2004 Izaki poll is that the religious conservatives are much more effective at disseminating their messages. But in this past cycle, we've seen the growth of an invigorated dialogue on progressive moral values. In this election cycle, we saw that more candidates are starting to talk more authentically about their faith. I think just last year, in 2005, many people saw what Governor Kane of Virginia was able to do when he started to talk on these issues. And in this cycle, in 2006, we've seen that debate expanded. As many of you know, all of you know probably, um, in Pennsylvania, Bob Casey gave a major address on the common good. In Ohio, Sherrod Brown discussed it at a call to renewal rally. Both of these candidates defeated their opponents, and they did so with dramatic gains among Catholic voters. In the gubernatorial race in Maryland, Martin O'Malley did the same, Kathleen Sebelius and Jennifer Granholm all incorporated common good themes in their campaigns. In Connecticut, Jody Rell was reelected in part because of her vision for a greener America. And in Minnesota, Keith Ellison, the first Muslim member of Congress, has called for common good policies like universal health care and energy independence. So what we've seen is an incredible resurgence of a moderate and progressive voice um, in the context of this conversation with values voters. But what does this election cycle really mean for the right and for the progressive faith community? Who are the real values voters? And what impact did all of the great work that was done over the past couple of years have on this cycle? And what does it mean for the future? Today, as I said, we have an incredible panel that will help us dis discuss these issues and address them. 
I just want you to keep in mind that this will be a nonpartisan conversation, and our panelists have been asked to refrain from endorsing any candidates and political parties during the discussion. So we're going to be hearing from these panelists in a minute. I'm going to give you just very brief introductions because you have that information in your packets. Um, first, I want to introduce Reverend Timothy Ahrens. Reverend Ahrens is a senior minister at the First Congregational Church in Columbus, Ohio, and he's currently the co-president of BREAD, Building Responsibility, Respo Building Responsibility, Equality, and Dignity, an interfaith organization working for economic justice and social change. Reverend Ahrens writes for the Columbus Dispatch's Faith and Values section and is author of Acts Come Alive, 12 Keys for Reviving the Church. Next, we have Anna Greenberg, who is Vice President of Greenberg Quinlan Rosner Research and a leading polling expert on religion, women's health, rural issues, and education. And she's advised several campaigns, many campaigns over the years, um, including 2004 presidential candidates. And she recently advised um, two successful um, congressional and Senate campaigns. Um, and next to Anna, we have uh, Reverend Samuel Rodriguez. And he is the president of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference, which is widely regarded as a leader of the Hispanic Latino Church in America. One of the most prominent religious voices today, he's founding pastor of Third Day Worship Centers and author, and also on the board of directors of the National Association of Evangelicals. Next to him is David Quo. Um, he's Washington editor for beliefnet.com and writes a blog called Jaywalking. He's also the author of Tempting Faith, an Inside Story of Political Seduction. And previously, David served as special assistant to President George W. Bush and also as deputy director of the Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives. And last but not least, we have Jonathan Miller. And he is the state treasurer of Kentucky and author of The Compassionate Community, Ten Values to Unite America. He's been identified as an emerging national leader by organizations such as the Democratic Leadership Council, the United Jewish Communities, and the Institute. So I want you to join me in thanking and uh, welcoming, actually, the members of our panel today. And now I'm going to turn the floor over to Anna, who's going to give us a brief presentation with, I think, some really interesting research. And after that, we're going to engage in a conversation. And then I'm going to invite you to join us with your questions. So Anna? Thank you for having me here. Um, it's really um, an honor to be on this panel with this esteemed, these esteemed guests who do the real work of faith and politics instead of just analyzing it like I do. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the role that religion played in this election and the much, uh, the much uh, maligned, vaunted, however you want to describe it, values voter. I want to acknowledge right now that I'm actually speaking about this in a fairly limited way. I think that traditionally, at least as the press and you know, political analysts have thought about religion and politics and thought about values voters. They have defined it very narrowly, usually around the so-called family values of ab abortion, gay marriage, maybe stem cell, but a range of other um, but quite narrow um, values issues. Um, and I think that what we're going to hear from this panel today is that there's real work to be done to expand that definition of what a values voter is, and that work was happening in this election. And I think it's actually we're at the beginning of that process, the very beginning, but it's, it's quite exciting, and I think it challenges a lot of the ways and the categories that pollsters and other analysts used to thinking about these issues. But that being said, I'm going to fall into the trap myself and, and talk about <laughs> this in the way that we've talked about it in, in polls. Um, is this all queued up and ready to go? Okay. Let me start by just making a couple introductory comments about the election in general, because I think it's important to understand the dynamics of the election, the structure of the election, and thinking about these issues more narrowly. This was an election that was locked in place for at least a year. Really, if you look at the post-Katrina period, um, if you look at all measures of partisan mood, whether it was the direction of the country, Bush's job approval rating, uh, the approval rating for Congress, the what we call the generic congressional question, which is what, I, what is uh, being shown on this slide right now, meaning in a generic context, would you vote for a 